Well, hello, we are live. This is live television, <laughs> or live internet television. And the guy I'm talking to knows a lot about that, a pioneer in live television, Ron Bacon, who lives in Sedona now. And my name is Steve Sandner. And um, I'm just really just so happy to be able to talk to Ron, who's a friend, been a friend of mine for about 10 years or so. And he's had so many great stories that I, it's just screaming out to be shared with people, some of your stories, Ron. So um, really, really, really happy to, uh, just a little bit of Ron's background. And he'll, he'll, he, will, he will tell you more of it. He started out as a TV producer, writer, and director back in the 1950s. And I remember some of the 50s. And um, then his creative endeavors branched out from there to all kinds of things like filmmaking, writing musicals, writing songs, um, and, and other things that he's probably going to tell about that I don't even know about, possibly. So, uh, <laughs> so Ron, um, we're just going to get right into it. I'd, I'd like to know where you grew up, what your family was like, what your parents were like, what... Where did you? Where are your first memories on this planet? Well, I, I, I was uh, born in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and um, I grew up all over the east, pretty much. Uh, my father traveled a lot. We lived in uh, Buffalo, New York. We lived in Chicago, Illinois. We lived in uh, 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 Minneapolis, Minnesota, uh, all over the place back east. And uh, but my basic childhood there was in uh, Evanston, Illinois, and I went to uh, Lincoln School there, and uh, that was quite a good school system, and I I, I enjoyed that uh, six years, and then when the war came along, World War II, my father was transferred to Akron, Ohio, and the family had to move to Ohio, and uh, that's where we spent a lot of time, and that's where I. Uh, what pretty much that was kind of my base of operations for the next four or five years anyway. And uh, I think it had some influence on me too, because uh, it was a, it was farm country, World War II, uh, rationing time. Uh, wow. I mean, we brought in the crops. We, we replaced the guys who had to leave. All the men were gone. Everybody. Six years from 18 years old on was gone and uh, up to 18 to 40. And so uh, there we were in the middle of farmland and uh, crops had to be brought in and things had, you know, it was a, so it was left to the kids. We did it, you know? So that was good. I think good, good training actually. Well, we know you eventually got into television, especially live television. When, and did, were you into radio at the time before television? Yeah, I, first job I had was, yeah, I should go back. Uh, I, I graduated. I went to three different universities, Colgate University, University of Arizona, and uh, and Kent State University, which I graduated from Kent. And uh, that's the school where they shoot the students. You know, that's a, you probably heard about that. Yeah. The, the National Guard, yeah. And... But that wasn't during my era, that was later, so I shouldn't really put them down too much about that. But I was uh, very much involved in theater there, and um, I did uh, a number of shows working with them, and then I was in radio, they had a radio station, and I, I did radio as an announcer, and I did, we also did drama, and I wrote some drama for, uh, radio station KTLA, which used to play our stuff on our dramas on Saturdays. And um, so I had experience as a writer. And then I, when I graduated from Kent, uh, I went to Mansfield, Ohio and worked at WMAN as a, a radio announcer. Uh, it was a network ABC station. And I was there well, doing all kinds of stuff. I mean, you, some of you do the news, you'd 
just do station breaks. Uh, you would do commercials. And I got to the point where, I mean, I was working for the glorious sum of $30 a week. <laughs> <laughs> and a full-time job. Can you, I mean... I mean, how do you do that? You know, I was I had a six dollar a week rooming house, and I really had to be careful how I spent my money. And, and a lot of times, after, I, after you had a college degree, yeah, with a college degree, yeah. Well, in those days, I was lucky to get that job. I mean, I went, I looked for months before I got employment. I went to every radio station in Ohio. I went to everywhere and tv station too trying to find a job and uh, it was it was during the eisenhower administration it was right after world war ii and and uh, the economy was in it was tanked you know it just wasn't good and there, were, there just wasn't a whole lot of stuff that you could do so i was very i mean i when that job opened up that was to me was a grand opportunity because i didn't intend to stay there i i, I knew it'd move on and uh, I, I did, finally I went to the station manager and said, I need, need to make more money. Can I sell some time? And he said, sure, go ahead. So I went out and in a couple of days, I brought in several thousand accounts, <laughs> got, myself, got myself going, and I, I, and I like tripled my salary. So that was able to, to, to function there a little better. But one of the jobs I had at WMAM was very interesting. I, on on Saturday night, I had to do a two-hour country music show. And the people from all over Kentucky and Ohio, southern Ohio, would come with their musical instruments. You didn't know who was going to show up. And they'd bring their moonshine, and they'd they'd come in. And I, I was the only one there at night, and they'd... they'd uh, I had set up folding chairs for him. We had a, a microphones, a piano, and so forth. <laughs> and uh, they'd just come in and play. And uh, they were darn good. I mean, it was, it, was, it was regular country music, but two hours. So there was this one guy, uh, this young kid who played every instrument in the world. And he was, but he had a high voice. And uh, I was really impressed with him. I thought, gee, he was really, really good. He was only about 12 years old, I think. And so I recorded him and I, I sent the recording to RCA and they said, no, his voice is, sounds like a girl. It's no good, we can't use it. So that was the guy who later became Mr. Las Vegas for many years, <laughs> oh. you know who that is? Uh, y y yeah, the guy who did Dankeschön. What's his name? Right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I can't think. And of I mean, yeah, but he played. Still played all those history yeah. yeah. I, well, I'm, having, I'm having what you call a '90s moment. <laughs> wow. <laughs> you made a discovery. Yeah. yeah. So but that was uh, live radio. It, wasn't, it had nothing to do with me. I mean, they they <laughs> they put me down, and I was surprised when I. When you it was Wayne, Wayne Newton is the guy, Wayne yeah, Mr. Wayne Newton. Yeah. <laughs> For many years, um, I mean, and Wayne even bought a hotel there. He was so successful. <laughs> so you never know about showbiz, do you? It's just, it's... Yeah. Well, that was live radio, so that was a natural transition for you to go to live television? Well, then I, uh, when I was working in radio, the... I, I began to realize that the television was the next big thing and you couldn't, you couldn't uh, make a living in radio. It was really hard. So I, I somehow managed to get a, a shot at uh, WNBK in Cleveland, which was an NBC O and O. Uh, and I had been there before, but I had an advertising agency executive who was going to help me, make a, a better resume and he they because they had an account at uh, that at WNBK they had uh, he had arranged with the program director that I could have a camera and I could hold up a box of stuff <laughs> like, like I'm trying to sell it I think it was Ziploc or something I had and uh, so I 
I, the cameraman was there and the program director and I'm holding up the, the box of stuff and I'm taking the picture for the, for the resume. And uh, the program director says to me, well, did you want to, did you want to work at in television? I said, well, that's, that's the idea. He said, we don't have a job as a radio announcer, but I could use somebody as a, as an associate director. I didn't even know what that was. And, uh, I said, well, that'd be, yeah, I'd love to do that. He says, could you start today? <laughs> <laughs> I said, well, I, I'm just on a, a, a couple of days. I got to go back to my radio station where I'm working, but I could, I could help you out today. And then I'll come back in a couple of weeks when I, because I have to give notice. So he said, well, we'll do that. So that very day, <laughs> I wound up. Yeah, we we're doing some kind of thing on the street with with a bunch of models or something. And I was supposed to tell the models where to go and stand, and that was my job. You know, I didn't, I didn't I've never done the job before, but they put a headset on me, and and, and uh, so I that that was my first job was pointing to a bunch of places where models should go, <laughs> without any idea what I was doing. And that was television. That was television, so it was a it was a quick break in, <laughs> and uh, from there, I learned all the the various departments, and eventually, uh, went on the national board of the uh, directors guild from Cleveland. I was a member from Cleveland, and um, when I went on the national board, I got to New York, and when I was in New York, I told the a person who was running the Hollywood office that I'd be interested in working in Hollywood if I could. And uh, one day I got a call from Hollywood, uh, got a job opening at ABC. Uh, would you be interested in going? <laughs> I said, what, what does it do? I said, well, you got to be able to count bars and music. Well, that was easy. <laughs> and uh, I guess they needed somebody who could count, count bars of music who could do this job. So I, that's what, how, I, how I started out. Wow. <laughs> I mean, it's funny how things... Now, it, it's not all that quick and all that easy when you're doing it. I mean, you know, it's, it's <laughs> well, there's sure. things that happen. And, for example, when I got to ABC, I drove day and night with my wife to get there. And uh, I get to the gate, and the uh, unit manager who was in charge of everything there is waiting for me and I introduce myself and he says, well, I'm sorry. The, the, the job is, is, has been oh, no. <laughs> no longer. Yeah. He took it, said it wasn't going to happen. So then I, I had to, <laughs> I mean, I had, I had packed up everything. I'd quit my job in Cleveland. <laughs> oh. So, so I'm looking at my a friend of mine says, well, I could help get you a job selling Venetian blinds. And I thought, no, I don't want to do that. And um, so I was, I hung out there, but before I left to go back, I thought I'd go back to Cleveland because I, 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 I was getting nowhere on the West Coast. I, on my way out, I stopped by the Director's Guild office and I said, if there's any reason to call me, I said, I'll show you I'm my itinerary and you can you can get in touch with me. Well, I get to a friend's house over in the Tucson, Arizona. I just get there and there's a telegram for me to come back. Job open again for four weeks. So I go back and then the four, four weeks became forever. <laughs> oh, wow. ABC was but, good to you. Yeah. Yeah, eventually. Eventually, eventually ABC, you know. <laughs> but you never know. So I worked at NBC when I was in Cleveland. I worked at ABC when I was at uh, at uh, Hollywood. And then I, I later, at the very end of my career, I worked at uh, Fox. And uh, so with Arsenio Hall, which was quite a success. So it was just a... Yeah, that was much later. Yeah. Well, Forty years people, later, people are going to want to know about um, you know your time with Lawrence Welk because that do you, I think you told me that was a very highly rated TV show at the time in the nineteen. It was number one. It was number one. It was number one. So and, how did you and get there, that gig? 
Well, that was interesting. I, the four weeks that I had was uh, doing the Ray Anthony show. And uh, that's the job where I had to count bars and so forth. And But I worked as associate director on that show. Well, it turned out that I knew Ray Anthony because I'd met him in, in, in Ohio when he was touring with his band. And I was working at the radio station. So I, I knew Ray a little bit. And um, I hear a little echo of my voice there, which is a little annoying. You got a little echo? I might have yeah, to go to earphones. Okay. I think I can do that. So I'll talk while you're doing that. Uh, so there, so that might be better. Is that better? Yeah, I think so, yeah. I don't hear the noise, you know, the echo, which was, okay. it, it was, it was, it was kind of weird. So anyway, uh, Ray Anthony was somebody I knew, and and so I, I, I worked the Ray Anthony show, which was a was a music show, and of course On she was ABC. married to to Mimi Van Dorn in those days. Do you remember who she was? She was a Marilyn Monroe lookalike, very very pretty blonde hair lady. Vaguely remember. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're you're younger. You're too young, I guess. But uh, Ray would. Uh, was very good. I mean, he he liked to he he liked to to take off and not be going to all these rehearsals and stuff. And so he would let me kick off the van. I mean, I you know I was just giving really? him a downbeat, but it was kind of fun. <laughs> I'm giving a downbeat to the you know. And a lot of these guys had had worked with Glenn Miller. I mean, it was it was a hot group of musicians there. And um, yeah. That gave me a lot of experience working that music show. That was great. And then from there, uh, the director of the Ray Anthony show knew the director of the One Lord Club show. So he introduced me to the Lawrence Welk director. And they were very much impressed with me because of what, I mean, we'd had a good relationship on the Ray Anthony show. And so, uh, I eventually got a job as stage manager on the Welk show. And then from stage manager, I worked my way up to eventually directed the show. And uh, I did an awful lot of the Welk shows. There were well, I don't, a good many years of it. And Lawrence was a very good friend to me. I mean, he certainly was kind. And in fact, all the Welk people, they were just marvelous to work with. It was more of a family, the Welk show. I mean, it's funny, I worked on so many big, important shows like Sinatra and Julie Andrews and stuff, but you never developed that kind of um, family relationship. Well, on the Welk show, I, it was like a bunch of brothers and sisters and stuff. I mean, it was really interesting how close everybody was. It was, a, and it, I, I understood that a lot. <clears throat> We did a, a show in Hawaii, and I remember I was on a uh, on a raft. I was just on a. a it wasn't. We weren't uh, doing any particular number that day, but I was on a raft, and there was a Hawaiian family uh, running the raft. The, the person who was guiding the raft and the motor was also playing the bass at the same time, which was kind of interesting. <laughs> Steering the raft and running them and playing the bass. And then there was a, an upright bass. Upright bass. Yeah. <laughs> oh, and, and of course we weren't going all that fast, but <laughs> running the tiller and playing the bass. And uh, there was a, a, a ukulele player, of course, and a singer and, and, uh, they were doing these these corny Hawaiian songs. I mean, they were, you know, to me, little cornball stuff. But I noticed how the audience was reacting. I mean, they loved it. They were in, I mean, it was just, their eyes glazed over. They were just entranced with, with the whole thing. And I thought, so that's really the key to Lawrence's success. I mean, he's reaching this audience in a very special way. These he knows these people really well, and that was uh, something that 
I, I was just beginning to understand. Of course, I wanted to play here and play jazz and stuff. He had great musicians in the orchestra. They were, these guys were the top guys you could get for, they were studio musicians, you know, they worked, they do gigs in the studio a lot after they do the regular show. And um, Neil Levang, incredible uh, guitar player, just, and well, all, all he could play almost anything he could put in his hands. He could play fiddle, he could play banjo, he could play anything. Became a close friend and uh, some of the other people that I, I got to know really well on the Welk Show, became really close friends. Ronnie English was one. Um, gee, I'm trying to think. Uh, what Wasn't was Pete it? Fountain in the band for a while? Yeah, Pete was in for a while, but it was uh, it was not quite his. It, he didn't feel like he was. It was the right venue for him, you know. Right. Uh, but frankly, I don't think it was wrong for him i think i think there was a lot there for him because well did a lot of stuff that very well would fit on a, in new orleans you know and uh there were a lot of you know you every everything had there were yes everything was cover of songs but there was there were always opportunities for other stuff you know and uh so there was a that was a an incredible education in music because he had great arrangers. He had great musicians. And yeah. I learned a lot about arranging by talking to these guys. And I was writing music, and I'd take my arrangement, and the guys in the band would play my stuff for me on a 10-minute break, see whether <laughs> how it worked out. I mean, what a – it's just amazing to think about it, you know? It was, it was wonderful. Now, this I mean, was going – and um, they had Les Humphreys was another guy I remember played. Did he played? Was a drummer. He was a great drummer. Yeah, fabulous drummer. A great See, jazz we got drummer. The, we got the best. You know, now these guys. There were a lot of guys played jazz. I mean, Henry Cuesta was on. He was an incredible uh, 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 clarinet player. You know, well they all played reeds too. You know, all these guys. Uh, I think I remember him. Uh, yeah, they were just uh, Bob Smale, just an incredible arranger, played the piano, just a wonderful musician. Well, you take Joanne Castle; she was played this hockey talk piano. Yeah, she was her. an amazing musician. She could play any classical piece with the best of them. She could play anything. She was just, and she was a real character, a lot of fun, and. Uh, a very very talented woman, I know. Well, what and was I knew your these people. what was your job? Were you to try to find the camera angles, and did you have to manage other cameramen? Yeah. Well, it would depend on my job. When I was stage manager, of course, it was being in charge of the floor. Uh, what was going on on the floor? All the props and stuff were worth it. Making sure things were where they're supposed to be, and actors where they're supposed to be, and uh, guiding traffic and calling, making sure that the people are, are where they're, you know, that's the job of the stage manager and, and bringing in the sets. Uh, you're in charge of everybody down there. Every, you're in charge of the floor. That's what the stage manager does. And then the associate director, you're in the booth working with the director and you're helping with his calling the shots. And uh, you're, there's just a whole lot of work that a director has to do that is, is becoming, you're kind of like a second director, but he has the overall authority. And then uh, from that, I also did direct a couple of the Welk shows and actually had the complete uh, control of everything. And well, here, I want to show a picture of yep. you with Lawrence Welk. And uh, you, oh, maybe okay. you could comment on this because it's a very interesting picture. Okay. <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's Ron Bacon and Lawrence Welk. <laughs> I was working on a show called Shindig in those days. I don't know how many people would remember Shindig, but... Well, we're going to talk I, about that, too. I was working with a lot of rock and rollers. I had to find an identity that worked both places. 
Now, obviously, the beard and the hair wasn't exactly Lawrence Welk. But, you know, Lawrence liked me. And he brought me next to him and said, Ron, I want to take a picture with me. I mean, I was dumbfounded when he did that. Just before that, Sam Lutzen said to me, Ron, you got to cut the hair. you got to get rid of the beard. It's ruining our image. And I said, Sam, you're ruining my image. (laughs) 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 But uh, uh, Larry Welk Jr. wanted to wear a beard and stuff. And so I think I kind of broke the the way for him to do that and, and then guys on the band started you know a little scruffier their hair got a little longer a little scruffier and <laughs> so but it, i think that was good because the show kind of matured with the days i mean you had to look at overall society was changing gradually you know and yes. uh so i was kind of a leader in a sense especially in regard to the Welk show so I brought people up to date, I think, by my appearance, or, you know, made it more acceptable. I mean, certainly, I, I stunned a lot of uh, executives at ABC. <laughs> you know, well, was, was, Lawrence uh, Welk's show was for, that was for our parents' generation, too. I mean, they watched the show, oh, that, yeah. and he played a lot yeah. of the old songs, and and uh, the, from the big band era, early big band era. And it's interesting yeah. to me, and I, I always wondered, of all the great big bands that were in the big band era, the one that became really famous in the 50s on television was Lawrence Welk. It was kind of a kind of a, a surprise that he would be the one to la- outlast all the other great big bands and, and be the star in the 1950s. Well, his secret was that he had a whole bunch of different acts and they kept changing. In other words, there were, we had like 20 numbers on a show and there'd be 20 different sets of people doing the, the singing, you know, or whatever was going on. And he had dancers that could dance. And, um, and so that was, and they had, they had a, they had a black dancer. They had a, a, a girl who was, uh, a Mexican, Anna Connie. <clears throat> so I said a number of people, and, and, and Arthur Duncan, of course, was black. So he had different people in the band who the audience could identify with. You put Arthur Duncan in there, you got the whole black audience, you see. Well, they that, had what, um, you know, that guy who was a mouseketeer who was a dancer. Um, yeah, well, what, uh, what was Bobby Burgess. Bobby. And we, but yeah. we, share, we share the same... Same birthday, May oh, 16th. Right? Yeah, that's ah. understanding. <laughs> but, uh, so you got to Bobby know him. The... Oh, yeah. yeah. Bobby was, of course, in the Mickey Mouse Club. and, and Right. He and was a musketeer. He was a musketeer. And in his, uh, his uh, partner, Barbara Boylan, I think was also. I'm not sure. I think she was, too. And, uh, he, of course, he had other partners over the years. Uh, Sissy King and... and uh, oh, mm-hmm. Bobby and Sissy, yeah, and yeah. and then the Lennon and sisters. You probably worked with them too. And the Lennons, well, we very, I was very close with the Lennons, really close to the Lennons, very very good friends. And uh, I, of course, I watched those little kids grow up. You know, I mean, <laughs> I, I remember when uh, when Janet was just a little tot. I mean, she was you know four or five years old, and we'd have to stand her on a <laughs> uh, uh, there, so we could see her with the other girls gathered around, and then there's of course the very sad story about their father. Do you remember that? I didn't know that. No. Well, they were, well, they, he was he was being followed by some some persons who eventually shot him, killed him. Oh my! And and, and Bill Lennon was just the nicest, sweetest gentlest person in the world. So what, it, but this guy was always around and, uh, you know, they complained, but the police couldn't do anything. They, you know, it's just, uh, and something else I found out, and this is true, 
so many of those major stars have problems like that. Um, hmm. The accordion player, Mike uh, Ma uh, Myron Florin. Myron Florin. Had some woman, yeah. yeah, some woman who thought she was married to him, thought she was a princess, and that they were married. Or something, some weird, <laughs> just, I mean, he was constantly bothered by this woman. Couldn't, you know, and you, you but you, you tell the police about it, they can't do anything. Now, he was a good accordion player, wasn't he? Yeah. Myron, was he as better than Lawrence Welk, do you think? Oh, God, yes. No, Lawrence <laughs> only, Lawrence was primitive at the best, I would say. His, I mean, he could play <laughs> primitive accordion, but no, certainly not. Uh, I mean, he would hit a lot of clams when he played. And, <laughs> but, but he did it with such enthusiasm, and his audience didn't notice you know <laughs> i mean it was uh and and then i think of the singer uh irish tenor uh, joe feeney marvelous singer oh yeah god what a voice i mean there's so uh, and then there's the a guy with the deep voice the real deep voice larry um, hooper yeah larry hooper yeah, yeah way down low but and he was a, a piano player too you know good good musician uh all these people were so capable. I mean, and the, the one guy we haven't mentioned uh, behind the scenes was George Cates, the great musical director that they had, who oh. was, was he the conductor? Would he conduct conductor. the band? Yeah, I remember yeah, he would conduct the band. that guy. I didn't know his name. George, George, George had a beard. No, he got away with it. You know? Oh, well, you know. <laughs> and George was a very, he was a very colorful guy. And, but he, uh, managed to to write a number of songs, but he would uh, uh, he was accused by band members of stealing the melodies. I don't know if that's true or not, but that was <laughs> I don't know. But or he would he would grab he would get great lyricists to come and write for him. He would take like they'd say they'd say well I mean this is be a typical somebody say well he, well he took the t the second trumpet part from such and so. And then he called in the, the great lyric writer so and so, and they, they gives it a name, you know, and it becomes a big famous thing. Well, but you listen to a damn good song, you know, so <laughs> you can't really say, you know, so it was the second trumpet part. All right, well, you know, maybe it was or maybe it wasn't. Now, when you were I, first on the Lawrence Walk show, it was in black and white, but then it switched to color. Did that make a big difference in your job when you, when you went to color, color television? Yeah. And, and what year was that? Was, that was, I think, 1965 when we got color at ABC. Oh. Uh, we, the first shows were done in black and white because that's all we had, black and white cameras. And uh, so ABC was, ABC was slow getting to color. In fact, one of the reasons Shindig went off the air was it didn't have color. Oh, uh, the competing show Color Blue was in color, and it kind of knocked us off the air in a way. Uh, hmm. But the Color Blue format was just stolen completely from uh, from the Chindig, which oh. the great Jack Good had produced, and, and was just an incredible producer uh, and a wonderful show to work on. But that that just I mean, there's so much stuff like that. I. I, one time I had a little film company with a friend, uh, Ari Michael Bender, uh, and uh, we called him Les Bender at the time. And, and Les Bender and I were doing a little filming and, and uh, we did some uh, stuff for Dick Clark. We did a whole bunch of uh, short uh, documentaries during the 60s for him. Uh, for uh, basically for his producer Rob Rob Roz Ross, and I think it was for the show. It's happening, but it could have been for some other. I for, I just don't I don't recall the exact show we did it for. It might have been. There was one show they did on the beach, and I forget. It. There was another one that. Uh, anyway, we we shot these documentaries and. What was I going with this? I'm trying to think what the point was. I, I had a, <laughs> I had a reason were, for talking. You were bringing story. up your your partner who was helping you make oh, film yeah, shorts. Yeah. 
Yeah. Uh, yeah, Bender. <clears throat> Les Bender. Les Bender, yeah, yeah. So, but um, we we we've got gosh, I've got a whole list of things here. I want to find out how you went to the shindig, but first I want to ask you: was was Walt Disney on ABC at the time? Or I well, yeah, you, yes. And yeah, what, did, did you meet him? That. I actually had a, a marvelous conversation with Walt uh, when I was a stage manager. This is back in the early days. Uh, I was assigned to do a closed circuit broadcast, and it was a two-way conversation between Walt Disney and uh, Mr. Reynolds of Reynolds Aluminum Company. And they were, Reynolds was coming in to uh, be one of the sponsors on a show called Zorro. Oh, yeah. I used to watch that. And that show hadn't, it was just, it hadn't gone on the air yet. So, the, the whole idea was that Walt was going to show the rough cut of the show Zorro to Mr. Reynolds to make sure that he was on board with sponsoring it. And uh, so I was assigned to this, and I, I, they brought me in a little early because they weren't quite sure when Walt's plane was coming in. And uh, he was coming in from, uh, from from France, I believe, and uh, or from Europe somewhere. And uh, so Walt shows up and he's got a beard and he's just in a, in a checkered shirt, <laughs> not, not dressed up fine or anything for the interview. And he's two hours early. His plane got in early. And so uh, we started chatting. He said, well, I said, well, what were you, what were you doing in Europe? And he says, well, I had to take a vacation. He said, I had, I had a heart attack and my, Doctors told me I had to I had to slow down for a while, so they made me take a vacation, and I went to Europe. And while I was there, it just so happens we were making a movie about the Matterhorn. I said I wasn't supposed to, but I simply had to go there and see what it was all about. And he said, "Boy, that Matterhorn! That was the greatest, most beautiful mountain." And on and on he went on. And I said, "Well, you ought to maybe." Put it in the in the in the park. Oh, you know? <laughs> oh was so this, be, was, this was before was Disneyland. Was, well, no, Disneyland existed, but there was no Matterhorn <laughs> at that time. And oh, so I, I see. I'm just kidding. I'm going to put it in the park. <laughs> <laughs> so he said, "Yeah, well," and they started. We started talking about what, what you could do and have toboggan rides and blah 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 and all this stuff, and. I, I mean, I, that was a casual conversation to me. Four days later, I look in the newspaper, and they're building this. <laughs> the park. Wow, that was fast and work. How much steel? They're telling you how much steel is going into it, and, and the whole deal. I mean, it was incredible. It had already been. Now he might have already had it in his mind. I don't know, and I just somehow picked up on it. You know, I don't really. I'll never know. Or what, yeah. did I actually? Caused the man to think of putting it in the park, <laughs> or was it, or was my vote enough to make it happen, which yeah. is a possibility. But what an extraordinary thing! I mean, yeah, well, I, I just to back, talk I, with Walt Disney alone for you well, know a period yeah. of time—that's pretty amazing. Now, I, I, Walt Disney was very much a part of my life because when we first, my wife and I first moved to. Uh, uh, Los Angeles, we were in an apartment in, in uh, Hollywood area, not too far from ABC Studio. And our neighbor is the chief animator at Walt Disney Studios, Mark Davis. And we got to know Mark and Alice Davis really well. And Mark uh, also on the, just, just to, at Disney suggested he always had to give back, taught at the Chouinard Art Institute, and I took some courses from him. I mean, it was in art. And I mean, what a, so he became my, the godfather to my children. Wow. Hey, so, hey, I'm, got, I'm, on, I'm on the air. 
<laughs> my son just came came by to visit. He doesn't oh. know I'm on the air. My son Chris. I'm talking with Ron Bacon. My name is Steve Sander. Ron Bacon is a uh, early pioneer of live television in the 1950s with Lawrence Welk and Shindig and and many other TV specials. Uh, and he's Thanks also a uh, yeah, Frank's. Well, you can. I, we could go on a long list of names, including Frank Sinatra, Dean Martin, um, Mitzi Gaynor, Bob Hope. Well, I'm going to ask you about some of these names. We we better get to it here. Um, but I I think um, we went from Lawrence Welk to Shindig, which is quite to to the casual observer that looks like quite a, a jump of styles. So how did you how did you get the gig on Shindig after being on Lawrence Welk for so long? Well, I, I, it was pretty simple because there were only a couple of us working at ABC who were associate directors in Hollywood. And mm-hmm. that was, in those days, we did everything that was that came to Hollywood. I mean, I, I worked on sports shows. I worked on Academy Awards. I did, I mean, it, whatever it was, game shows, it didn't really matter. There, there were only a couple of bodies available. <laughs> so we got all the gigs, you know. It, and and it, 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 you might ask, well, how how did you ever fit that in your day? Well, exactly. You work hundred hours, you work hundred hour weeks. That's what you do. <laughs> wow! Because you were doing Lawrence Welk and Shindig at the same time. Well, no, because they weren't they weren't simultaneous. Those oh. two shows were separate. Uh, okay. Welk had Welk had it was had gone into syndication by the time I was doing Shindig. I see. Okay. Uh, but you know, I guess what had happened with Welk was uh, they they moved over to CBS for a while, and when they did that, they lost me being a regular on the show. I have a little thing more I could say about that. I uh, Don Federson, who had produced the show called The Millionaire, the uh, mm-hmm. popular uh, film show, and had other many other very highly successful shows, actually owned Lawrence Welk. As, as to the best of my knowledge, he was, he was one of Welk's stable. And uh, so Welk's uh, manager was a guy named Sam Lutz. And these two people had a lot of influence on everything. I mean, Sam had real control over a lot of what went on and so did Don Pedersen, of course, you know. And then the sponsor, uh, the Dodge Motor Company in Plymouth, they also had, so these executives had a lot of control, but well, knew how to, he played golf and these guys played golf with them. So it was all, you know, all good. But uh, that. They didn't want to take you to CBS with them. So what happened was that I, I, ABC wouldn't let me go unless I had to quit my job, you know, at ABC. Oh, well, wow. I had, I had uh, accumulated a lot of seniority and, and there were other things there. And uh, so severance pay that they could were owed me and all that stuff would have gone away. So I really couldn't just go over to CBS and ABC wouldn't let me go over. They asked, they, they asked if they could borrow me. And uh, so I didn't go. Well, things didn't go too well in some ways, I guess, about my job. I don't know. But I was on the lot at ABC, and I was, at the time, directing uh, Rona Barrett or some darn thing. And, and uh, Sam Lutz and, and uh, Don Federson catch me coming out of, a, out of the parking lot. And uh said, Ron, I want to talk to you. And I said, yeah. And he said, Ron, if you would come to work for us one day a week, we'd guarantee you a world, a, a week's or a year's salary. Gee. What an offer. But you couldn't do it. I couldn't do it. I, was, I just had too many commitments, you know. <laughs> and then Boy, what- I hated it. I hated but, to turn that one down. Gee whiz. But then when did Shindig uh, come about and did it sound like a good 
good show to you at first when they told you about it? Well, Shindig was, uh, as I, I did the pilots for Shindig. Okay. And originally, the original Shindig show was going to be a, a country western show. It was going to be country western. <laughs> and they, but they were going to have go go dancers, which was a twist that the producer put on it. I mean, go go dancers was, well, that's, that was Jack Good. He loved to put odd things together. And, um, uh, so we did the pilot with the, with the go go dancers and, and 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 country western music. Well, it, ABC didn't buy it; they didn't think it worked. <laughs> so Jimmy O'Neill, who was the announcer, was looking for a job, and he he asked Jack Good if he could use the show to show somebody his announcing ability in New York. And uh, Jack said, "Sure, you know." So he shows the pilot but to, to demonstrate his ability as a as an announcer and the people in New York say gee this is a great show it, it just needs to be something it can't be it can't be country but why can't it be rock and roll or something I don't want all of a sudden you know, I mean that's how cr crazy things are and all of a sudden <laughs> yeah, Jack it's, by accident yeah, producing the a rock and roll show. I mean, I remember he did a combination of, of rock and roll and opera one time. He produced a show, went on stage. It was a it was rock and roll and opera. I don't remember. I never saw it, but that was Chuck. He just loved to put things together. So you he get a phone a call. Somebody calls you up and says, "Hey, you remember that Shindig pilot? We we want we need you to work on that, and it's going to be." But it's not going to be country music. It's going to be more modern pop and rock and roll. And you said, yeah, fine. It, was, it wasn't all that. It, 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 nobody even called me up. They just told me I was going to oh. work it. <laughs> oh. That was it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you had to do what you were told. I didn't, I didn't know anything about it because I hadn't been doing any, any rock and roll. I didn't know any of these people. None of them. I'd never heard of any of them. Well, what, what about, was, was little Richard on one of them? On one of those shows? Oh yeah, well, R Little Richard, of course, was a very big deal. And I, I, I can I mention? Oh sure. So my daughter Summer was at one point married to his drummer. Oh, how about that? <laughs> so we were close family. I mean, I we knew I knew Little Richard really well. Yeah. Your and, daughter was married to Little Richard's drummer. Okay. Right. And and Little Richard was a close family friend after that, of course. He was know. a good drummer. Well, but you want to tell the story about Little Richard and um, how did you get to meet Little Richard? That's a most interesting story. Remember the, the, the kind of the, like the rioting thing that happened? Oh, that's a little bit more. Uh, when I was, I, she, my daughter wants me to mention this story about, uh, I, as I said, I, I knew Little Richard really well. Way before I knew Little Richard. <laughs> and I, one of the things I on, on Shindig was a very complicated show. It was the most difficult show I've ever done. It was really, really, I mean, we just, we segued from one number to the next, to the next, to the next, to the next, nonstop music. It was, it was a, for a stage manager, a tremendous challenge. And so one day Jack Good, the producer says, you know, we're, we're doing a benefit concert at the, at the Shrine Auditorium, on a, it's on a Sunday, and we need some volunteers to help us put on the show. And and so uh, I said, I need some volunteers. So everybody's not really wanting to volunteer on their day off, a lot of them, you know. And I was one of them. <laughs> but I caved in because I, it's, I thought other people were going were gonna to come in, you know. So the day of the show, I get there, and I'm the only guy. And I'd never worked on a, a live stage like that before. I mean, that's that's a whole other thing. And we're putting, got all the regular sets, all the hundreds of, I mean, I'm performers. It's a two-hour show. And so the guy who was supposed to direct it who had told Jack he's going to direct it. He'd never directed before, so he didn't know how to do anything. And so we sat for hours and nothing happened. 
And finally, I went to Jack and I said, Jack, we haven't rehearsed one single number. I said, we've got to do something. Gosh. And he said, well, what do you suggest? And I said, well, I don't know. It's but we Somebody's got to do something. He said, well, do you want to do it? And I said, well, what else? Who's left? <laughs> so I'm not only the director, but stage manager working on this show, lighting director, musical director, I mean, you name it. I had all these jobs all descend on me from every angle. And so we worked, did the best we could. And, and then it was time to break for lunch. And then we're just supposed to just take an hour and come back and, and uh, the audience is gonna be let in pretty quick. Well, we had only done half the show. I hadn't rehearsed the second half of the show. But, oh my God, what am I gonna do? So we did the first half of the show for the live audience <laughs> and it was a tremendous success. And then we break for intermission and we got to come back and do the second half. And I don't, I, there's nothing that has been rehearsed. So this guy, PJ Proby, British guy, rock and roller is to be the first act. And so he comes to me, he said, Ron, he said, what I want you to do he says, leave the curtain closed. And when they introduced me, open, put the put the light on the, the the spotlight on the corner of the curtain on the stage right side, and I will just show a part of my body a little bit. And then we'll continue doing that, and each time we'll show more of me until we finally open the curtain. So I said, okay, so the spotlight, the tele spotlight operator going right, stage right side of the curtain, show just the side, and he probably does a little thing, the audience screams. <laughs> and uh, so then he shows a little bit more of himself, and they scream some more. And he shows himself a little bit more. And I, I know this was probably bought and paid for, but he apparently had hired some girl to run down the stage screaming toward the stage. And she did. I don't think this was spontaneous. And what happened was she, the audience rioted and came in behind her and she fell into the orchestra pit and broke her arm. Oh, my. And the fire marshal closed the show. He pulled the fire curtain. Oh, my. Said, your show's over. Well, that was swell, except, I mean, for me, I didn't have to do the rest of the show. But we had a riot going on outside. These people had paid to see the whole show. And uh, so we were inside there, stuck for hours. I was in, I was in little Richard's dressing room at the time. And uh, we couldn't get out the stage door because there were the, the crowds were out there. <laughs> we're stuck Gosh. there for hours. So I got to know Richard even better. <laughs> I guess. Did he was he one of the performers in the first half? Yeah, he was. He was in the first half. Right? And who else was in the first half that we we may know? Oh gosh, I don't remember. It, don't remember. You know, it's a, it's a blur. But there were, it was all big, big names. There was all, somewhere I, in my house, I think I have the copy of that script. It was, unless I got so disgusted, I threw it away. I, I don't know. But I, it, it was, it was a typical Shindig show. We had nothing but big acts, one after bing, bang, boom. I mean, you know, Little Richard would just be one act on, he would do his yeah. thing and somebody else would go bing, bing, well, bing, bing. Well, I know you had the Rolling Stones back when they were just up and coming band. Um, yeah. They the weren't Stones, even famous, yeah. really famous yet, were they? Yeah. Or they were. Uh, I remember. I and remember you said something with, about a white, that you had to ma make them wear well, white shirts or the, something. The, 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 or they couldn't the wear white shirts. Some. Well, there were a lot of things about it. Uh, for one thing, the, the Rolling Stones 
the first time I ever saw the Rolling Stones, they were uh, working at the Hollywood Palace. And I don't know if you remember the Hollywood Palace show produced by Nick Vanoff. And uh, it was a wonderful show. It was a variety show with all kinds of stuff on it. People and Zoax and everything else you can imagine. It was a potpourri of things. But uh, anyway, the, the Stones were on there. And they had just shown up from England and they, and they were they were very big in England. Well, the I think it was Dean Martin was on the show and I, I, maybe he was emceeing the show or something. And he made a lot of fun about these British kids with their long hair. And I mean, he didn't like rock and roll or any part of the what they were. And he just kept insulting them. And the audience was right with him. And when they got up to perform, they were booed. The Rolling Stones were oh booed by the audience. And that was at that, yeah. what is the name of the theater? The... That was at the El Capitan Theater in oh. Hollywood on Vine Street. There. And were you working the show or were you just there to, to watch it? Well, I was working. I was a, I was stage manager. Oh. And uh, so... Uh, that that was not a happy moment, as you can see. So the audience booed them. And so when we're coming out of the theater later, I'm, I'm walking out the stage door and the stones are coming out at the same time. We're walking together there and, I, and I'm, <laughs> I'm saying, I'm saying to Nick, gee, I'm so sorry, you guys. I think you're just great. I said, I loved your, your harmonica solo and blah, 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 you know. And I was trying to, you know, because it, it was a bad thing, you know. So the next time I work with the Stones, they're on Shindig, and now they're, they've, just, they've got an audience, and there are people that, that they're, they're, but they had agreed to do Shindig for scale. Mm -hmm. And uh, now they're, they're, they're feeling a little puffy, and they're saying, Jack, we don't want to do this show. We're not going to do it. We, you know, you know, that's not enough money. And Jack's saying, "Well, look, guys, you you agreed to do it. You know, and it's a good it's a good venue for you. You'll get more more sell more records, <clears throat> and so forth." And um, finally, they stopped off and they went back to their dressing rooms. And so I I I caught Mick, Mick Jagger, and I said, "Look, Mick," I said. This is your time on a stage. If you want to rehearse, it'll have to be now. We're not gonna. We're not gonna adjust. We cannot adjust to do it later. And I said, I don't give a shit whether you have your rehearsal or not. But this is it. And I suggest you come back on and, and do the rehearsal. I wasn't that kind, but I, I did, I did yeah. encourage them. So. They came back and they did do the show for scale. <laughs> All right. Well, what is it about the... It was the last time ever they did anything for scale. How I'm about... Sure. What is the, the story about their they, they couldn't wear white shirts or something? The... Well, that would, that would have been part of it. Uh, we, we, no. were, we were in black and white. And, uh, oh. and uh, those old cameras that they sent us from New York, would, they would bloom and blossom with the, the white shirt was on it. So we had all the shirts were always blue. All shirts were blue. Guitar players had to have blue guitars. You know, well, then why did they white. wear white shirts? Why? Well, they weren't, they weren't supposed to. And you told Mick not to wear white shirts. I told him not to. I told Mick you can't wear them. You have to put on blue shirts. And they didn't want to do that either. You know. <laughs> well, the, then they when they wrote their song, the lyrics to the songs, I Can't Get No Satisfaction, they have a line in there about you know, white shirts or something. <laughs> so that might have come from your comment. <laughs> it's not, not impossible. <laughs> you know, I, was a, I, I think in all the, of all the people I worked with, I never ever had to chew out anybody like that. Ever. Like Mick Jagger? <laughs> Except but, for but Mick I Jagger. Other, but, it, but, but that's interesting. He's British, okay? And there's a certain attitude 
that that goes along with being British. I, I I'm not. I, I love the British people, but there's certain things that I worked the Tom Jones show, and uh, the director was British, and and he he was a he would say some very cruel things to the to the to the crew, and he would he would just be nasty at times. And I finally one day I I said. I said, you know, I just, I, I, I just stopped it. And I said, you know, I said, well, these guys are working their butt off for you. They're trying to make your show as good. They, they want a great show, just like you do. I said, we don't do these things exactly the same way you do in England, but you're going to have to get used to it. And I, I really cheered yeah. them out. And that was the last time I did that show. <laughs> naturally okay well fired. there you go <laughs> well what about other other shindig was glenn campbell on shindig no uh sure yeah glenn Campbell was yeah he was a regular yeah and he became a close friend of mine uh, uh, because we shared a lot of interest in guitar and banjo and stuff i'd go in his dressing room and play some music with him you know once in a while or show him some things i'd learned or Oh, would sometimes he'd call me up and ask me for lyrics to a song or something, you know. <laughs> so Ben was a he was a good guy. Uh, when he was working, he was incessantly practicing. He never never ever stopped, and it drove the, some of the other people crazy because he he would do everything forever. Until, right. But. A lot of acts that did it were kind of that way. I've got another picture to show you, and you can comment on it. Okay. Well, yeah. that's Chet and Jeremy, the British. Now, they were very, very big back in the 60s. They were number one all over the world. And they were guests on Shindig. And I got to know both of them very well. And... Uh, a number of years later, after Shindig went away and everything, I, I had a little recording studio in my home, and who shows up to do some recording but Chad Stewart. And uh, so Chad did a lot of work at our little studio, and he worked with my son, who was a, also a musician, and uh, recorded a bunch of stuff. Phil Hartman. And also, uh, did Phil Hartman come Bill Hartman was 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 also one of our the people in our little studio. We had we had a number of uh, it was inexpensive. I had had an eight track studio and uh, it was very reasonable for people to come and do stuff there. And uh, we attracted a lot of pretty big names. Uh, so so Chad Hartman Stewart was a he wasn't quite contrary like the other British uh, musicians were. <laughs> Well, the, he had an edge, you know. Uh, Chad, Chad, Chad had an edge. They all do. Uh, I mean, I since I had worked with so many British bands, I, I was quite familiar with what what to expect. But they could be they could say cruel things. I don't. They, I don't think in England it, they would be thought of as cruel. You know, it's just a different culture. They just had a way of of. When they were didn't like something, making it quite obvious, instead of being diplomatic like we try to be. But uh, Chad was a, became a very close friend, and he and his his uh, uh, girlfriend uh, were very close with my wife and I, and they would come and visit us. And then my daughter, uh, I think, even produced some concerts for Chad later, didn't you? Dar? So, uh, I, yeah, I, I found their first gig coming back as Chad and Jeremy. She, uh, she, uh, my summer, my daughter, uh, got Chad to, uh, do a, a gig and brought them back. They had been away for a while and, and she convinced them that they were ready to, to go again. But my son also, um, went on tour with Chad. There were, there was a British invasion bands tour. And he, they, Chad and Jeremy didn't have a band, and so they asked my son if they would form a band for them. And so my son got some of his musician friends together, and they formed a band to back up Chad and Jeremy. And 
they opened in Madison Square Garden, New York, and that was the first time my son had ever done a big gig. I mean, it's like, wow. Well, and the place was full. Yeah. Well, I heard a I heard a story. I think uh, Summers gave me a hint that you had Bob Dylan in your studio. And yeah, you Bob a, was a. You have an interesting story about that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Bob Dylan came in, did an album. My son was the engineer. The engineer. This was my big studio that I built. Knocked Scott, out, loaded was the name of the album. Yeah, knocked out, loaded was the name of the album, and. Uh, we did it at Skyline Recording, which was a, another studio, the second studio I built, which was world-class studio. And um, so Bob is there <laughs> and uh, they they do their thing. And I mean, I met Bob and he's a nice guy and talked a little bit and, and they finish up their album. And uh, so one, one day I'm in the studio, just I come in during the day and uh, they had been recording the night before. And I find this little piece of paper on the floor with a whole bunch of lyrics for the for one of the songs on Knocked Out Loaded. And I said to myself, well, here, here's Bob left this. And he said, oh, he probably didn't care about it anymore. We've already recorded that. I said, well, what do you want to do with it? He said, I just throw it out. So I, I threw it out. Oh, no. <laughs> if I had this today. Oh, gee. <laughs> I mean, it's. <laughs> so that's, that's the story with Bob Dylan. My goodness. Well, so you, after Shindig or at some point you had the studio where you got, got to meet another lineup of uh, musical Celebrities like uh, Frank Sinatra, he came in. Did he come into your studio? Well, no, no, that was Sinatra. Of course, was very early. Oh, he was on your TV, on your TV uh, yeah, experience. He was one of the first. Of your... uh, always, when I first started at ABC, I had we did a lot of live shows, and the pictures you have uh, of, of Sinatra and so were, were taken. This was back in the. There we go. In, in the, in the 50s, probably around 1957 or so, these pictures were taken. And that's uh, that's just everybody that you see in show business. Jimmy Van Hoosen on the far left, okay. the great songwriter. Uh, there's Dean Martin and then Bing Crosby and then Mitzi Gaynor and Frank. And I'm in the back there, just way in the back. And then Sammy Kahn, who another was, uh, Sammy was uh, the producer, but he also wrote many songs for Frank, like sure. uh, he uh, works uh, for, uh, uh, what was the one about the the children, little children's song? Uh, uh, Jump, swinging on a Star? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And Sammy was just a, and he, I knew Sammy, Somehow I had met Sammy Beck in the radio days when I was in radio. I, 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 I don't remember exactly how, but I met him and he remembered me somehow. And uh, Sammy became a very good friend of mine. It, it was a, he was just a great. Now, I do have one interesting story about Sammy. When I was doing a Bing Crosby show. And Sammy was the producer. And uh, this was a, it was a special. It was called Planks for the Memory. was the, was the title of the show. And it had it was a had a whole bunch of people on, including Mahalia Jackson, as I recall. Kind of interesting. And um, one of the guests was Dean Martin. And so Dean was supposed to come on just after the station break at halfway. Now in those days, our shows had a half hour, they would do a station break. And that was a, one of the formula things that they did. And then after the station break, we, we were to come back and uh, Dean was going to do a, 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 a bit with uh, Bing. Now, both Dean Martin and Bing Crosby had reputations for being laid back kind of lazy guys. And there was a thing in the film industry called a slant board. I don't know if you, it was a, 
a, a thing that looked like like a slant was built on a slant, and the actor was said they had some heavy, like a girl with a, with a dress she couldn't hoop skirt with a hoop skirt or something could could rest by just leaning against this board at least get some relief during the day. And uh, it was the same thing for, you know, any heavy costume, somebody wearing uh, armor or something like that. So anyway, the slant board is part of every movie set. And so the idea was to have two slant boards facing each other. And uh, Dean was going to be on one. And uh, Bing was going to be on the other one. And, and right. uh, you know, so it was, this was... Uh, oh, Bing. Bing Crosby, yeah. So Bing Crosby, you might have a picture of Bing Crosby. Well, he's there in this one. There may, he may. There's another, there's another, you got another. There we go. Is he in that one? No, that's that's different. Oh, no, that's not Bing? I, I, might, I might not have sent you the that's one. Bing, though. That is Bing, yeah. but that isn't the show that I was talking about. Okay. That's me on the right next to Perry. Anyway, um, this, this, you know, this, we did this show over at NBC, and... Uh, so anyway, it, 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 everything was live. And um, so it, it, when the show started, Dean wasn't there. And so I said to Sam, well, I said, Dean's not here yet. And he said, well, he'll show up. And about 20 minutes before, I said, uh, Sammy, he, uh, Dean is not here yet. He said, oh, don't worry, he'll show up. So about 10 minutes before we get to the station break, Dean shows up and he says, I got to have a drink. And so Sammy takes a water glass and pours it full of Jack Daniels and gives it to him. He just drinks it straight down. He says, I got to have another one. And so Sammy gives him another water glass. I think mean, this is going to kill the guy. He zips it down. So it's time now for us to go out on stage. But guess what? Dean can't walk. <laughs> He's too <laughs> drunk. So Sammy gets on one side of him, and I get on the other side of him, and we take him out. <laughs> I'm serious. This really happened. And we take Dean out, and we prop him up against the slant. God, it was a slant board. <laughs> he could do that. And so Bing gets on the other side, and they get the cue cards out, and I, there's been no rehearsal. And so D D Dean says, oh, well, turn that thing over. I can't see it. And so the, he grabs the cue card and turns it over. And, oh, oh, I see. Wait a minute. What are we supposed to say here? Well, the audience is in stitches. <laughs> this is a drum pack. And this guy is, I mean, it, he just killed him. Just being drunk. <laughs> You know, and and I thought about it later. Is he really an alcoholic, or did he just use the alcohol to force himself to in the character? I don't know, but it was it was an extraordinary. I mean, it was hair raising, to say the least. For you, yeah. yeah. Oh well, for how about how about uh, Sammy? <laughs> yeah. You said the slant board held him up. The slant board was was what, what propped him up, you know. I mean, <laughs> the show must go on. <laughs> the show must go on. Um, yeah, that, uh, you had, had a story about Bob Hope and your you had a, a book of cues. You were oh yeah, and the that first, was a, uh, yeah. It was the first. You, I think it was a, the first Academy Award show I did as a stage manager. And uh, Bob Hope was the MC, and uh, so it may it may not be the first, but anyway, Bob is there, and I see him, and he's just before we're just about to go on the air, and we've rehearsed the show and so forth, and he says, "Ron," he said, "Would you mind taking my script out and putting it on the podium?" which was on the other side of the stage. And I said, sure, just, you know, so I took the script 
Now I'm walking in front of the curtain, which hasn't, the show hasn't started yet. And I put the script on this, on the podium, not realizing all of a sudden the Star Spangled Banner starts and we're, we're on the air. And so I rush across to the other side. Well, as the orchestra starts to play, the orchestra pit comes up and there's a big suction. And I had let, laid my script at the side of the stage and the suction forced the script down between the crack between the, uh, the elevator that was uh, going up. And, oh boy. And, and, and all my cues, 250 cues. I had 250 cues. Things that had to, that had to be I, queuing uh, sets in and out, you know, I mean, stuff. It's very critical times. <laughs> well, I, so I rush around. I'm trying to find somebody who's got a script. Of course, my cues wouldn't be in there, but at least I'd have a script. I couldn't, nobody would let me have their script. There weren't any spares. I couldn't, it, it was, it, I had to do it. The whole show from imagination. <laughs> Somehow, I did that show without missing one single cue. But what an indoctrination! <laughs> you can blame it on Bob work. Hope. It's his fault. <laughs> it's all Bob's fault. <laughs> he was a good guy, Bob Hope. I, I I worked with him a number of times. Just he was a lot of fun. He loved to crack jokes, and uh, he, he just he, like guess. like many. And they're always testing. They're always testing their jokes on you. You know, <laughs> just never nonstop. <laughs> and it's fun, fun being around people, people like that. Keep you, keep you smiling. <laughs> well, um, I'm going to see if anybody has any questions, because I have a little uh, chat window here. Somebody's asking about Rocky Rockwell, the trumpet player, with Lawrence. Yeah, Rocky. Yeah. yeah uh -huh. Was well, he with I, mean, uh, uh, I remember working with him. I mean, he was a great, he was a great trumpet player. Uh, I don't, uh, there was some story. I, 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 I don't want to be wrong about this, but I think he left the band because he was drinking too much. Okay. I think, I think yeah. Lawrence, I think Lawrence let him go for that because you, Lawrence wouldn't allow, wouldn't allow that, you know, just. I was a trumpet player, so I, I know that they they can do that. <laughs> well, sure, was. you couldn't work on a walk show and, and drink. I mean, it was not allowed. You know, well, if you did, you certainly had to keep it pretty well hidden because um, you didn't approve. Did, was was the um, show um, Barney Miller on ABC? Yeah, I, I did some Barney Miller stuff. Did you meet Max Gale um, on Barney Miller? He was a, I, I worked with Max, uh, Max Gale Sr. Senior, and Max Gale Jr. The guy, was, I, the guy I remember working with was, a, that I, I, I mean, he, he, the guy moved to Sedona, actually. Oh, yeah. He was the, one of the lead, the lead actor, the guy with it. Oh. Um, I can't remember his I name. I can but, picture him, but I can't think of his name. So lanky, knows. tall. Yeah. Yeah. He always had, he was, you know, yeah, he was always had this attitude. As well. But uh, Marty Miller was, that was kind of, those were the days of the downfall of live television because there were no more live shows. They started shooting shows for on videotape, but they would shoot using video cameras like film cameras where we used to just do everything on the fly. They uh, would stop and go, stop and go, stop and go. And Barney Miller, the guy who wrote the show was always late with a script. And I remember that the crew always was complaining. They would want work these incredible long hours. And it was very boring working on those shows. You know? Is it Hal Linden? Yes. Might've been. Yeah. 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 Captain Barney Miller, Hal Linden. Yeah. 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 Those were wonderful. I mean, he was a good writer, and the shows, after they got it all edited together, terribly funny shows. But as a crew, that's why I liked working sports shows. You're busy, you know. And, and when, when, and when, in the days of live television, which ended 
toward the end of the, I mean, Shindig was one of the last live shows I, I remember doing pretty much. We did a few mm -hmm. specials that were sort of live, Julie Andrews and stuff, but pretty much it was a, the, the live days were pretty much over after that. And uh, I thought it was always very inefficient. I mean, we had developed such skill with doing it the other way. Why, why would you develop? But the problem was that the guys that we were getting for directors were motion picture directors and they didn't know any other way to do it. So they do it one step at a time. They would, motion picture director would just, only could think one camera at a time, you know. It was, it, they were wonderful directors. They were, they were great with people. They, they, I would say they knew far better how to how to stage people and, and get the maximum performance out of an actor. They certainly did that. But uh, there, were, there were things we could do that they couldn't do. And it would have been nice if they could have come together. I did work with film people a number of times. Uh, sometimes I would be called in to do a... Oh, they would want to audition a bunch of actors or something, and they would have me. They'd bring these actors, and they would nobody would try them out, and they would. I would do, have them do scenes. Well, I I didn't know what they were doing. I mean, they would come in and they'd have a script. Well, I hadn't even read the damn script. I didn't know what. So they had some scene from some movie they wanted to do. I I wasn't familiar with the material. It was really tough. So I had to do a quick sight read of the script and then tell them what to do. <laughs> it was, I mean, what, what, a, what a grueling task that was. That was like, it was, you know, and you're you're watching the clock all the time. You don't want to spend too much time doing something. But you don't want to, you want these kids to fail. You want to give them a good shot. <laughs> well, there was some well, live TV later, like um, Saturday Night Live yeah. and, um, was always done live, and then um, wasn't the Veltro? The only phone? show there. Pardon? I never did Saturday Night Live because that wasn't on our, our network. But I did right. a show called Fridays, and that was live. Ah, and there was a lot of a lot of wild stuff went on in that. That was a crazy show, <laughs> and it, it, it didn't last too long. But it, it was it, it, during its time. It was it was a very good show. It, it, it moved right along. And it was supposed to compete with the idea of Saturday Night Live, which has been on forever. That's, that's just. And what about the Bell Telephone Hour? Was that on your network? The, or Bell Telephone Hour was, uh, was a, pretty much a radio show back in the. I thought early they did days. a few live TV shows with Andre Previn they playing might have, piano. They or... might have, but they were probably done on CBS or something. Because. Oh. Uh, we didn't do any show like that at ABC. No. Well, speaking of scripts, um, you eventually did your own movie called uh, Kite Song. And um, you you were kind of, uh, somebody kept badgering you, I think, until you did your own movie. Yeah. Uh, the, the producer of the uh, Welk Show, Jim Hobson, was a very close friend. He, he, he just, he and I got along really well. And uh, he was always urging me to do things that he, he really liked to do. I mean, of course, he was a busy guy, you know, being the producer of the Welk Show. And I, but he, he was always kind of thrusting things on me. And he said, Ron, you really ought to make a movie because Jim had studied in college, apparently had studied, uh, movie making. Well, I, I knew about how to make movies, but I hadn't done any, I didn't have any official college or high school training. And I had taught myself. And, but Jim was always saying, Ron, you got to make a movie. And so he gave me a copy of the uh, wonderful book. Uh, oh, by the by Russian I, guy. I, Eisenstein, called I think the Film Sense is the name of it, and it's a, a remarkable book written by somebody done way way early. We're talking long before I was born, and uh, 
a remarkable book about his filmmaking and how he went about it. And, and it, just a, he was a, and still is considered to be a giant. In the, in, if anybody is, is interested in film history, Eisenstein's a guy you, you just have to know. So anyway, Bill, he gave me this book, The Film Sounds, and I read it. And I, gee whiz, it was what an education, you know, it was brilliant, absolute brilliant. Uh, well done book. And so, so that led that to the movie. That was combined with other things. I, I, I made the movie, I made it on a, on a shoestring, and I, it was. I, I, you know, it, but it, it would, was successful enough to be, it was on, played on Sunset Strip on, in a 16 millimeter, it was done in 16, in a, in a 16 millimeter house on Sunset Strip and then uh, in Hollywood there. And then it, a shorter version of it played at uh, the movie theater in uh, Goleta, which is where the Santa Barbara campus of the University of uh, Southern California. Right. So I just, I just want to say, um, I, I saw it for the first time. It was made, you made it in 1967 and it has a sort of avant-garde feel to it, a European almost feel to it. And, yeah. Yeah. um, uh, it is, is very unusual, very creative movie, uh, in all different, all ways, the script, the, the technique, the, the acting. In fact, one of your actors is standing right next to you. Your, your daughter was in, and my daughter in the film she, she was yeah. five years old <laughs> <laughs> yeah so um you had your kids uh, uh you didn't you didn't have to pay them a union scale apparently right well, you gotta, you gotta and, get them cheap <laughs> and uh, yeah. and, uh is, is it okay if I, oh what does yeah. summer have a comment well i was going to say in the oh. opening scene the the, the the kids come out and they're playing the playing uh, a song, the title song of the movie, which is Kite Song. And and uh, my son's playing the guitar and she's playing a tambourine. They're coming out walking and she is walking on these biting ants that are <laughs> she with bare feet. <laughs> Poor child, he's out there. He didn't Aww. know that. He didn't know that. I didn't know. <laughs> she had, and she was being such a trooper. She didn't tell me these ants were biting her feet. <laughs> well, now so she's she a got, movie star. She got broken in the heart. <laughs> <laughs> Is it okay, by the way, if I put a link to your movie in the description of this video when I post it on Facebook and YouTube? Can I put a link to I don't, it? I don't think there's a way to. Yeah, no, you've got it on YouTube. Brit, uh, put it up there. I just want Is your permission to do it. Just, yeah, do we want to? Do we want to do that though? It's up to you. You can think about it if you want. If Summers well, my is... Daughter, my daughter says we have to do it, so... Yeah. I think okay, I so I have your permission to do that? Yeah, I just... Okay. I, I just You have to caution people. There's some pretty it's, dark yeah. stuff in there. I mean, you know, yeah. it's not for children. Definitely it's don't, like don't... Film noir. The link, yeah, the link does have... Uh, uh, it does say that it's not suitable for, uh, you know, children and okay. stuff like that. You know, it's, it's just, it's minor violence and, and minor sex. Yeah, it's not like today's crazy, really it's crazy just, stuff. It's just, it's just violence and sex. <laughs> There's nothing really in there with you. So um, if you want to see Ron's movie, I'll have a link to it in the description. Of, after, I'll have to put it up there after we're done with the interview. Um, so use your own discretion. And... Um, so I'm just going to go over a couple of the names from Shindig because you have a list here of, I don't know how many names are on here, but it's like over a hundred well, names. And uh, we, I don't know how, how much time you have, but I, I don't mind listening to stories, you know, forever. But um, like Louis Armstrong, Louis Armstrong. Well, yeah, Louis Armstrong. I the best story I have about Louis is when I worked with him on a Frank Sinatra special back in the early days. And um, Frank and, and, and Louis were, were rehearsing with, we were at 20th Century Fox is where we were doing the rehearsal, although the show was going to be done at ABC. Uh, and um, 
So we were at the 20th Century Fox Studios don't exist anymore. That was all. It's now Century City. What, what's it's, if people in LA would know what Century City is? That that was a movie place at one time. And um, anyway, Louis was a guest on the show. And uh, he and Frank were going to rehearsal with Nelson Riddle, I think, who was the musical director and uh, conductor. And so the band is there, and Frank is there, and Louis is there. But and, and he didn't like being called Louis, by the way. It was Louis. My name is Louis. He'd say, um, Louis Armstrong. Anyway, Louis Armstrong. Was, didn't have his trumpet. And uh, he said, uh, Ron, would you mind going up to my dressing room and getting my mouthpiece? He just wanted to practice with his mouthpiece. He wasn't going to use his trumpet. And I said, sure. So I ran up the stairs to the dressing room. Oh, my God. I'm Wow. I'm going to what? You know? And I get up there and I go in and there on the bed, I see his trumpet case, which is this case that is old and it's got years and years and years of everything that the places he'd been in a sense. I mean, what a piece of history that case had to be, you know, sitting there and I walk over to it and I, I mean, it's the Holy Grail. It's to me, you know, I open the thing, and there's the trumpet there, and it's in some velvet, and there's a whole row of handkerchiefs, all lined up very neatly. As you recall, Louis would always hold a trumpet with a handkerchief because he would get perspiration in his hands. And uh, so then I go over to the little, on the right-hand side, there's a little compartment with, and I lift the little flap and there's the, there are two mouthpieces in there. And, and Louis had told me that you get, the, get the, the larger of the two trumpet mouthpieces. So I take out the trumpet mouthpiece for Louis Armstrong's trumpet. And I got tears in my eyes. I, my hand is shaking. I go down the stairs and I hand the mouthpiece to him and he says, thank you, man. <laughs> <laughs> I, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Wow. Well, I mean, it's a good story. Even as I tell the story, the I tear up. It's it just it, it was so big to me. I had such enormous respect for that great, great musician. I mean, he had created a whole style of music all by himself that we all play today. And we yep. we, we all, all need to tip our hats. You know? He's the top cat. Top cat. Well, um, I I you know, I mean, it, it, it's nice to be a nice guy. I mean, I, I love that. You, know, you it just fit, Louis, Louis, Louis. <laughs> well, on the other side I'm of the coin, right. <laughs> speaking of trumpet players, you you met also met Miles Davis, who was not quite as as uh, oh, Miles, comfortable uh, yeah. personality, but <laughs> he's inscrutable. He just isn't inscrutable as his playing. <laughs> You did. I mean, you had to deal with he him. Was, huh? He was. He worked at our recording studio. I mean, I tried to talk to him, and I mean, man, he was. First of all, he didn't like. He didn't like white people. <laughs> so I'm already in trouble. You know? <laughs> and and also, he. I mean, he he just had this this arrogance about him. What? But it, wow, what a what a musician. I mean, my God. What a, what a giant! No, it's just he's the opposite of of, of Lewis. 
<laughs> he didn't ask you to get a mouthpiece or anything. <laughs> no, no, I doubt, I doubt if he'd even let you within a foot of his horn. You know? <laughs> uh, what about Tony Bennett? To, you know, you know. I'm going to try to get through this as many as I can on the list, so I don't mean to interrupt well, you. But, two hours. You got too many to. We got too many to go through all of them, but I what what wonder what you uh, what you uh, when you met Tony Bennett. Well, he was on a, actually on a shindig show, one of the last ones that they did. Oh. Uh, Jack, Jack Good left the show. ABC was deciding that what needed to be done. The real problem was that they weren't in color, but ABC thought they needed some some a larger audience, and so they were having people who were more familiar with an older audience. And of course, Tony was, you know, well, Tony, he was a, he was a great back then and a very well known singer. And uh, he was a guest on the show and, and I, I got to meet him and he, what a grand and glorious man, you know, and he has maintained that professionalism and he's a damn good artist too, you know. He paints wonderful stuff. Right. Stuff. I think he, I, he's, I, he's still uh, around. He's. I think he's older than you are. He, he, no, he's two years younger than I am. Oh, excuse me. But but he has also not Alzheimer's. I think it is Alzheimer's. He's got you know. It just it, it just came out a couple of weeks ago. I think I read that somewhere. I hope it's not true, but I think I read that somewhere. What a yeah. sad thing. I mean, yeah. he those last albums he did with uh, duets. The duets. With, mm -hmm. Oh, my God, what great albums. Yeah. I mean, he brought the most out of the, Every singer that worked with him became exponentially better than they'd ever been. I mean, he just had a way... Um, of cre the the professional atmosphere that you worked in with with Tony was so intense and so artistically demanding that you would have to excel. You know, it was like uh, creating a, a a fertile ground for a musician to be able to sing a duet. Now compare those duets with the ones that Frank did, which were terrible. A lot of them. <laughs> yeah. which Frank did at the end of his life. Remember, Frank yeah. did duet. He did a couple albums of duets. But but there was nothing, there was never that that personal relationship with the singer that, that you know, Frank just did his part and sent a thing over and they'd do their part and that was it. And yeah. it's all, you know, but, but yeah. what the, the, Tony Bennett's albums have great if you ever get if you if you haven't listened to one, everybody it's should been a while. hear. Yeah, you're correct. He did he did announce he has Alzheimer's. I looked that up. My daughter says he he does have yeah. Alzheimer's. I, I think did I did hear that too. February first. Yeah. February February first that the announcement came out. If anybody has any questions, um, well, I'll, I can see it in your chat window. If you put a comment on uh, Facebook or YouTube, I'll be able to to read it. Is, is anybody watching? <laughs> oh yeah, we've got we've got a little group watching, and this is going to be posted. It's going to be watched later. A lot of people are going to watch it later. It's going um, on forever. <laughs> oh, uh, I, if you're if you anytime you you feel like you want to wind down, well, let me I know. Go, but... I go to bed in a couple of hours. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I just I've just got a couple more names to run by. If, gotta, are are you now, okay with? Uh, can we go a little bit longer? Are you okay with that? I'm okay. Okay, just I'm let just me know if you want to wind down. That's fine. I understand. Um, speaking of trumpet players, Dizzy Gillespie. Did you yeah. get to meet Dizzy Gillespie? Uh, I'm trying to think. I wouldn't wouldn't have been on Shindig. But no, no, I don't. Dizzy Dizzy might have been on a Sinatra show. Right. I, yeah, I, you know, Frank used to have all these great musicians. I mean, it, sure. it was amazing. I mean, it was just astonishing to be there. And what a joy for me as a stage manager. I, I got to 
talk to all these guys, you know, it was, a, it was such an education just to be around the quality of people that, that Frank knew, you know? Right. Yeah. I'm, 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 I, I would have to look it up. I, I suspect, I, I mean, I have a sense that I, I, I have met Dizzy and I also have a sense that it was probably on a Sinatra show, but I can't guarantee that. Well, those Sinatra shows are classics, you know, of course, now they were, yeah. they oh, are, gosh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, they just, they're part of like the golden age of show business. Well, we started out, the first show we did with him was a half hour show. Right. And it was, uh, it, it was on, uh, in the evening for, uh, and, I, and I remember the, there was it was there was a mix of uh, comedy and different things on it, you know, and uh, but uh, what was interesting about it was Frank would never rehearse. <laughs> oh my goodness! <laughs> and uh, one time I remember I, I learned real quick <laughs> with Frank. Uh, we had some kind of a, a step thing, and the director because it was of the the cameras that he went way had set it up he said i want frank to put his left foot on this step and start up this way so frank who never rehearsed comes out and he, he looks at the at the lights and he knows where he's supposed to i mean he's just an automatic he just knows what to do he looks at the lights he figures out where his, his key is he's figured out what he's going to do and i said frank uh, the director wants you to start the left foot on this step right here he said what is this some kind of of, uh, uh, <laughs> of a school you know, it's a, kindergarten I'm trying to think the exact words <laughs> but it was uh, you know like, I mean the way he was he just you know what <laughs> what are you doing here you know so I, <laughs> well I was tough to talk to this guy <laughs> you know, you know, maybe he'll take a swing at me. I don't. He had a reputation for doing that Jersey guy. You know? Oh my! He took out a lot of photographers, you know, <laughs> and people. He he took out a couple people. He, he I mean, one guy. I mean, it was a story about uh, uh, when he was at the Sands. He he, he was one of these giants, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he's like, oh, you could hit with all your might and he wouldn't move. <laughs> you know, you'd break your hand. But, so, and then, then, the, then the, the, the giant finally got angry and hit him right in the mouth, took all his teeth out. That when he's at the sands. Yikes. Now, the Rat Pack was something else, though, to work with these guys. Now, what was your role with them? Were you a producer? Well, producer? I, just, I just did shows that they were on, you know, and they were just playful <laughs> as hell. And, and I knew all those people. And, of course, Ernie Kovacs, who was sort of a adjunct part of that a lot. And I, I knew I'd, I worked with all the main gang there, of uh, Dean Martin. I, I did one year I did uh, this, the Dean Martin summer show. I was on that. Worked on that one, and but I did uh, a lot of stuff with Dean, and because they were always hosting shows, you know, and uh, yeah, I loved it. I, I mean, I I had just you know, Frank, not that always, sometimes a bit difficult person, but but boy, oh boy, was he a wonderful singer. I mean, you just there's nobody even close to do who can do a ballad. I mean, well, I, there are some good, very good singers out there, but Frank led the way, certainly. He had the phrasing, yeah. But his phrasing, his whole, his own approach, you know, he just, for one thing, Frank never did anything twice the same way, ever. I mean, he, it was, it just wasn't part of him. And and he just didn't want to rehearse. He, I mean, he, he wanted to be spontaneous. And it, it worked, it worked. I, I just I remember one time I'm doing a, a, a show and they got a I got a million guests on there and Peggy Lee's doing her number singing 
and uh, he's supposed to come on next. And I'm looking, where the hell is Frank? Oh my God, he's, I can't find him. And his, his number's coming up. And I go in his dressing room and there's Frank. He's sipping a cocktail and watching a football game. <laughs> <laughs> he's on the, uh, Frank, for God's sake, get out there, you're on. And he runs out. Oh, he says, oh, what? And he goes out. You know, <laughs> dashes out there, slides into place, down beat of the music hits. Night and day, I mean, it's like you didn't. <laughs> no problem, no problem. No, just, I mean, he he would have thought that would have shattered anybody else's nerves to, you know, be late. Like that. <laughs> no, not Frank. <laughs> just, but he'd done so much. By the time he was working at ABC, I mean, he started out when he was a little kid, you know. With Harry James. And, yeah. Yeah. And what something that, that I I've been told, and I don't I imagine it could be true, is that Frank was trained as a bel canto singer. That's why his breathing and all those other things, and 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 his, uh, I mean, you can hear every damn lyric, every little nuance in his voice is all right, right there, you know. But. He was trained by an opera star, you know, an opera singer. I know he listened to opera. Um, and he was he listened to everything. Frank, Frank did. Yeah, he was. I mean, he extraordinary talent. And another interesting story. I mean, I, I this just it just popped into my mind. He had a daughter, apparently. Out of wedlock, I'm trying to think of her name. Julie Sinatra. Julie Sinatra. Did you ever hear the story? About? And Julie lived in Sedona, that little uh, little place there. But uh, when Frank died, my understanding is that she sued and managed to get get some small part of the estate. Not much, but they did give her something. Sedona. Now, you've lived in Sedona how many years? Well, it's been 30 years, yeah. I was going to say, I, I wrote a song with with Julie Sinatra, actually. Oh. I mean, I did, you know, and I never went anywhere, but we did, I did, we did work together at our house. Yeah, time. you met her, and, and uh, when we looked at her, her eyes were that, that Sinatra blue. It was just crazy. Yeah, she had those blue, blue Sinatra eyes. Yeah. And looked, she just looked like very much like she could have been you know, Sinatra. And she had some other physical issue that was a, a problem for her, but she, she certainly- was a, She was a lovely lady. Nice, nice girl though, really nice girl. What do you, so do you like? Know. So uh, Ron, do you enjoy living in Sedona? What do you like about living in Sedona? Well, I, the reason I moved to Sedona was to get away from L.A., <laughs> you know, and uh, it also gave my wife and I an opportunity to do something else with our lives. I mean, I television was a lot of hours and, and uh, too many. I started to break out in hives, and I would have these terrible hives. My my lips would swell up so much that my, my, my upper lip would touch my nose, and mm -hmm. my eyes would swell shut. And, and it was life-threatening because once in a while my tongue would start to swell and I'd start to choke. And uh, That's a good one. That's very, when you know it's time to move. <laughs> well, that was... So I retired from television, not intending to, that early. I, I retired at, at uh, age 59, which was ahead of when I had planned to. <clears throat> so when we got to... We had to go somewhere and get the heck out of L.A., and uh, so I had an airplane. I, I used to, I, I've, I've flown all over the place with my little airplane. And so Lisa so you're and I- You're a pilot, would, you're a pilot. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. In fact, I've even, <laughs> believe it or not, I've got eight hours, or no, I, yeah, I think it's eight hours, eight hours on the, controlling the Goodyear blimp. <laughs> wow. <laughs> One of the people who has that. You're very, there's very few people who can say that. 
that, that was in Hawaii during the Lawrence Welk show that he talked about earlier. Yeah, it was, yeah, <laughs> Welk show. Anyway, uh, this, uh, the thing about Sedona was that uh, my wife was an artist <clears throat> and um, I liked doing art and also music and there seemed to be opportunities to get gigs working in Sedona and we did. And we played around town and we played elsewhere all over Sedona. And I, we had a, a kind of a Captain Tennille act. My wife was a great singer and I, I had learned from Lawrence Welk to keep it simple. Try not to, don't do anything too out there. So I would write these very simple arrangements that we would do with uh, equipment, you know, with a lot of help from my equipment. And uh, when I play solos, I would generally just play the play the, the melody. I wouldn't try to do anything special. And uh, although I did love jazz, I, I it wasn't what people wanted to hear. I got my lesson from yeah. Lawrence. Well, there's a good <clears throat> jazz scene in Sedona, though, isn't, isn't there? Some, some oh yeah, there's, oh, yeah, yeah. There's, I mean, it's but but we could do we could do big concerts with with what we did. I mean, we'd have. Mm -hmm. We'd have hundreds of people watching us sometimes, and and uh, I mean you know you, you yes you could play gig. Uh, we did a couple of club gigs, and uh, but it, my wife didn't like working in clubs. She hated it, and uh, she liked to be in concert. That was what she wanted. So that's what we did mostly, and it worked out for us. <clears throat> it was great. I mean. The, the one greatest concert we almost did, but it didn't happen. <laughs> this is a strange story. The uh, Rams football team, this, the St. Louis Rams at the time, were owned by Georgia Frontieri, who was one of the residents of Sedona. I've heard of her. Mm -hmm. And Georgia was just married to the guy who owned the Rams, and she inherited a hell of a lot of money. She was an opera singer. That was her background. Ah. Opera singer owned the, the Rams. And so in the year, I think it was, was it 2000? Uh, it was, yeah, it was yeah. 2000. 2000 was coming up. It was going to be the year that, that we we're going to roll over to the year 2000. It was Why 2K? The end, of the end of the century, yeah. So the Rams had won the uh, um, the playoff s situation. They hadn't had the Super Bowl yet. And Georgia wanted to have, she at her ranch in Sedona, wanted to have a big party to celebrate the fact that they had gone to the, they had won the playoffs. And so she had built a, a replica, she was very well, <laughs> of a, of a, uh, the kind of uh, hotel you would see back in, in the, in the old cowboy days, you know, where they had balcony and so forth and the, in the big stage and the, where the dancers, they come out and all that stuff. She had this beautiful stage, incredible bar. It was uh, probably 60 feet long. Uh, it was it was it was just it was immaculate and an incredible sound system and all this stuff. And we were hired to be the entertainment for this party. So I had to put a couple other musicians in the band and we had to, I started I wrote 40 arrangements and we practiced and I made these I mean we made damn sure we were playing really well. And we worked our butts off and got really good. We were really good. And all of a sudden, somebody says, well, gee, the airplanes are all going to fall out of the sky when the computer did change. It can't switch over to, you remember this? They yeah, thought oh, that sure. Good. Yeah. Why took it? Well, we remind the audience for people who aren't familiar with that. It, so Y2K, they said, well, the computer wouldn't recognize that number. <laughs> and the airplanes, they're flying with all this computer stuff. They're just going to fall out of the sky. 
So the Rams were told they could not fly. Therefore, the party had to be canceled. Oh. And Georgia had bought $16,000 worth of food for this party. I mean, it was, and everybody who's who, and, I mean, can you imagine what that would have meant to our career as a, as a band to have that sure. group of people? I mean, what an incredible opportunity that was. Did you pay? So you? They, paid us, they paid us. Yeah, sure. Oh, okay. You know, no, no big deal. <laughs> well, that's that's important. <laughs> they paid us for our rehearsal time, everything. I you know, sent them just said, send me, send me, go. And that was it. So I just, <laughs> and uh, that was very fair. And I thought they should do that. I mean, we we worked hard, you know. And uh, but so that's the biggest gig I never did. <laughs> <laughs> And what instrument been, you were were you playing? What instrument you were you playing in that band? Well, I was doing. I think I was playing keyboards. Keyboards. Um, and singing. I was singing. Actually, had a couple of solos singing too. Uh, but we were doing we were doing all the big jazz hits and our stuff. I was doing you know, it was really good material. It wasn't it wasn't the normal stuff that I did on the road with uh, Lisa. It was uh, you know more up to date and what's going on. Well, I loved living in Sedona because the, the, you know, we got kind of a jazz scene going there in Sedona. Um, well, it's wonderful. I mean, it, and uh, the church sponsoring these shows, I think that's just, well, we've had just killer, killer shows. I mean, the, the best damn people. And the, the, I mean, the, 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 yeah, St. Luke's church. Uh, jazz at the church at St. Luke's in Sedona. Oh yeah. my goodness! What are people from New York people, coming through there? Anybody who's listening who hasn't been to one of those concerts, the next time we get yeah. get them going again, boy. And of course, you've been a big star on those too. So. Oh wow! Thank you. I'll pay you later. <laughs> he also he's also the the church organist. I've, I've heard him hit a few, few clams and play any organ. So I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> hey hey. hey. <laughs> I'm just I'm, kidding. I'm, I'm just kidding. <laughs> oh well, you know, if if you if you have a musical career, it's going to happen sometime. Um, I want to ask Summer if she has any questions. She must have some questions in her head that I haven't gotten to, or that she's thought that I could have asked or should have asked or something. Oh, no, thank you, Steve. I mean, it's really wonderful. I mean, I, thank you for interviewing my dad. He's just an amazing person. I have one other story I want to tell. Okay. George Cates, George Cates musical director of the folk okay. show. I mean, George ran a, a tight ship, you know, and when Welk did an album, the way they did it, because you, they do it in a studio, and, and the musicians get paid quite a bit of money working in these studios. As studio musicians, the, the rate, union rate, very high. And... Um, so they would, with a, with a large orchestra, they do an album. It was always cover material, whatever, with some big hit album. And this one was uh, Winchester Cathedral. They were going to do this album, Winchester Cathedral, which was a British uh, I remember album. We had a lot of success. And so the rule was we do this in two, three hour sessions back to back. And of course, uh, when you're there in the studio, every 10 minutes, of the 10 minutes out every hour, the band gets a break and so forth. And everything, everything is strict union, you know. And you don't go over one minute. I mean, when they say it's, it's a three hour session, it's a three hour session. It isn't three hours and one minute. It's just, <laughs> My goodness. But you have to subtract the 50 to 10 minutes for the break, you know out of each hour. So you got, you're losing 30 minutes out. You're getting two and a half hours for, for that, that period. Anyway, we're doing the thing and to do with the large number of songs that were on that album, there was a lot of, a lot, a lot of arrangements that had to be gone through. And so George would go through and I'd circle the notes that were wrong and correct everybody's thing. And they'd, practice sections that 
they felt needed to be looked at. And of course, Frank, uh, uh, George Gates was very careful about everything. But we get to the end of the six hours and it's so we suddenly realized we hadn't recorded the main song, Winchester Cathedral. Uh-oh. So George rehearses the first four bars and the last four bars. And we look up at the clock and there's just time to do one take. And uh, so Bob Lito is the lead singer. And he sight, he's never seen this lyric ever before. He never looked at the tune. He's sight reading the melody, sight reading the words. And the opening line is something about when you when you when you ring your bell, and Lido sang the word "gal." <laughs> I'm ringing my gal or whatever. But he, he used All the right. word "gal" hey, the bell. That's better. Yeah, that's the way those actors. Why <laughs> <laughs> not? I swear to you, we never, was never another take. We got that that one song in. That was it. That was it. One shot. <laughs> and that's I mean, the Lawrence Welk orchestra no right? you're that talking about it. Lawrence Welk yeah yeah. that yeah. was George Gates you know with the Welk band doing so we can get we can buy that record and we can hear that lyric on it now we can hear that yeah <laughs> stop ringing your gal or whatever the, I don't remember the line exactly but he uses the word gal <laughs> And then there's another story. Oh, I get one quick. I gotta keep doing this. Good but, but George Cates, we're we're doing a a rehearsal, uh, and uh, all of a sudden, I guess it was a pre-recording for something, or something like that. Whatever it was, we're, we're going along, and, and and George is doing the thing, and all of a sudden, the bass player stops playing, and George, what the hell are you doing? He said, well, I hit a wrong note. And George said, if I didn't hear it, it's not a wrong note. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, well, (laughs) I know that I know that scene in the studio. If you you keep smiling and you just keep playing and if the producer doesn't say anything, you just go, okay. (laughs) Well, that bass player That's was great. a little, little conscientious there. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, you know, crazy things happen. <laughs> did um, did Lawrence Welk ever hear that Stan Freeberg comedy record of wonderful? Oh, I'm sure he did, yeah. Did he? Yeah, I'm sure <laughs> he, he, did. he had a sense you know, of humor. Also, huh? Lawrence liked jazz. I mean, he had, a, he, had a, he had a good collection of jazz. He liked jazz. He, I mean, he hired... To the top musicians who would play jazz, but well, not not on the show. You know, not they didn't really play bebop on the show or anything like that. No, no. They, we it, the farthest out we got was at one point. <laughs> and I, don't, I don't know why why it would happen, but he somebody I think maybe it was his son talked him into getting. And I don't know whether for sure whether it was Larry Junior, but somebody. Got him to get some arrangers who were out, a little out there, you know. You like the Elevens or something? There were some, you know, some guys that were doing some, well, there's some real dissonance in the orchestra, you know. Uh-oh. And, and guys who were writing with some real imagination, you know, some good, really good writers. All of, his, all of his musicians were great writers. There was no reason. I mean, any of them could write this stuff, but this people who are guys who are known for it, you know. And, uh, it, it 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 wasn't working out too well, you know. I, it just it just didn't it didn't fly. But he would he asked me he said and I, why why do you ask me? Well, because I guess I had long hair. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> he said he said do you what do you think of this these songs and this arranger? And I said well I I said I don't know whether it's right for the show, Lawrence. I said I don't know. But it, it, the show went on the year. Well, he did. He he did it, but they eventually dropped these arrangers because 
Oh. It just the audience was starting to fade away. They didn't they didn't like it. I remember he had a pretty pretty rocking arrangement of Proud Mary with, with the trombones playing the lead line, lead melody. Oh sure. Well they, you know once in a while they'd do some stuff. But they would imitate uh, some of the old bands, you know. The yeah. famous arrangements that had you know, one o'clock jump and things like that. It might things that had history of uh, large audiences, but uh, overall, the simplest thing was to, to 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 keep it simple. You know, that was just. I mean, he would. He didn't. Lawrence didn't like to have harmony in them in the in the sections. You know, if, if Clarence had, if the reeds had harmony, he'd take it out. <laughs> Too, it's I, I, too complicated. I mean, well, his audience were not complicated people. Yeah, when you These play a polka, you don't want too much dissonance and harmony, right? Well, you, you just have to realize there's an audience of people out there that love music, but they're very, they're very innocent. They're not, they haven't gone in into jazz or anything, you know. And and there's an audience out there for that, and. And certainly that was the, the secret to the walk show. Other people tried it, but never, they didn't realize they That's would right. just get too slow. But, um, but he was elegant. I mean, yeah. yes, yes, it, it was what it was, but flawless performances, you know. Right. Flawless. Um, a couple of people are just making a comment. A, a lady named Kelly Fromm from, said she knew you in the 70s, and she lived That's next true. door yes. to you. And um, she says, thank you for your ex telling your stories and experiences. Another person named Beverly Adam, and she says, thank you. And you can answer their comments on Facebook later if you want to. I'll wave to them. Wave to them. <laughs> and um, I, somebody named Tom White. I don't know if you know yes, him. Tom, uh, and uh, I, I still have a feeling Summer has a question that I missed. I just have a feeling she's. I have, well, she's full of questions. You, you know. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> you well, thank with her. <laughs> thank you, Summer, for helping put this together. I know yeah. you're doing this from your daughter's home and with her computer set up so thank you for your help let the audience see who summer is if they oh have seen goodness. come on come on oh, come sit where this is ron's daughter summer yeah you take my put no, the title no 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 just sit there daddy come, come on oh come sit, on sit. i'll just i'll lean next to you she can oh. lean in and say hello there's yeah. summer hi <laughs> you, go a little bit more toward your dad because we're at split screen there, there we go. Go. <laughs> all right summer bacon who also lives in sedona and uh, Ron Bacon, and they both lived in Sedona for quite some time. I've spent a lot of years in Sedona. I'm right now. I'm in Michigan, but um, thank you again for uh, sharing Isn't that. Isn't that we can have this technology? It's, that wonder allows it's wonderful, to this. wonderful, 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 wonderful. That's it's, a joke. <laughs> you know, when when I was working on it, everybody talked like Lawrence. <laughs> we all got. Everybody, everybody had their impression, huh? Everybody had their own smoke. And I, I used to do it all the time. It was like, it got to be a habit. We talked to each other like that. It was like, what? everybody's own smoke. That's hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> and his son would imitate him, you know. Everybody. Well, Lawrence was just a great guy. He was just a sweet well, he, guy. He was a great guy. Such a nice man. And and my dad told told me a story when uh, when Lawrence came into the green room and said, there were all these boxes of fragile things that said fragile all over it. And Lawrence goes, Oh, what is this? What are all these fragilities? <laughs> he, had his own, he had his own way of talking. Fragilities. In the, yeah. in, the, in the stage hand who had brought the box in, he said, Gee, I don't know, Lawrence. <laughs> and he went right along with it. He he went, was so no contradicting the boss. No. No, I won't. <laughs> best, best guy ever. I got to dance with him on the Lawrence Walk show. So, yeah, wonderful, wonderful. For sure. <laughs> yeah, he, well, he was he he he, he danced with my wife and uh, my goodness, he was and my son led the band. He he gave my son a baton and said, "No kidding." Yeah. Yep. Yep. And your son. Kid. And by the way, uh, you're looking at summer right now. And when you watch Ron's movie, which is called Kite Song, you'll see a little six-year-old girl who is summer is one of the actors in Ron's movie, which I'll, I'll leave a link 
down in the description below to um, so you can watch Ron's 30-minute avant-garde 1967 film noir uh, piece of amazing creativity. Yeah, it really is. It really is. Well, it's a it's a piece of history, certainly. Uh, I mean, uh, did I send you a copy of the notes how we did it? I mean, it was just yes. crazy. Yes. When I spent no money on this film. It was just it was a, we didn't you couldn't have bought the coffee on a set a regular movie set. <laughs> what I paid for this movie. It's probably time to let Steve go. <laughs> Maybe the aunt is ready. I I imagine Ron's gonna get gonna take you know take a nap after this or something. (laughs) Well, thank you, Ron, and thank you, Summer. I'm gonna run run and hide and say I wasn't responsible. What is that? I didn't. I'm gonna run run and hide and say I wasn't responsible. (laughs) Well, I did the best I could, Ron. I I think people appreciate your stories, and uh, it's the golden age of. Show business, as I said in the description, that's you're, you're pretty far amazing. You're more important artist than I am, and I would like to interview you sometimes. That would be <laughs> you've got, you've done more stuff, man. I mean, yeah, I saw you at the church. I saw you. I saw you playing jazz. Oh, and thank it you. It was Christmas time, and um, yeah. Chris Canellis was playing uh, saxophone, oh, and. Yeah. And you, you He's let him a good play Chris, Christmas time is here the, the the Charlie Brown song. Oh, we did a Christmas was, concert. Oh yeah, did I, yeah is that did. when I did the mad the mad version of Night Before Christmas, the hip hipster version? Could be, Could be yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's yeah, still getting yeah, views on YouTube. <laughs> I know. Yeah, I'm probably one of them who's like binge watching. <laughs> oh, fantastic! Well, thank you. Yeah, yeah. No, um, you're yeah, awesome. Ron, Ron's been a great. He's been a a lot of my gigs, and but what I'm really most thankful for is when I started doing live internet concerts. Ron was at my very first one, saying, "Steve, you got to turn the piano up. Steve, there's a distortion here. Steve, <laughs> you got to get it right. Steve, you need a better camera angle over here." <laughs> so that was really, really um, unnerving, but it was so helpful, Ron. I really appreciate your your help in getting me started. And then, I just, I, I, it was just a, I had to do something. <laughs> well, it was my first time doing it. I can't turn off the director. He's always, he's always I shouldn't do that. It's, it's, it's no, no, like, it was great. I loved it. I'm honored. I just, I just tend to jump in. I mean, I, I, I don't know how many times when I, I, there, there'd be a meeting about things and and everybody's talking and they're going along with something and I, Gee, that doesn't seem right. And I would just blurt it out, you know, and, and everybody's looking at me, what? You know? No. Well, it's part of your DNA. That's what it is. I, just, I, I can't, if, if things aren't moving in the right direction, I just got to have my two cents. I guess it's, you know, I'm a Taurus, so you know, with the bull, you know, bam. Oh, bam. the bull, yeah. Are you, bull? yep. I know. My <laughs> sister's a Taurus. Yeah. Oh, um, well, you know it. <laughs> so I, I do live concerts on uh, on another YouTube channel on Wednesdays and Sunday evenings, if anybody wants to tune in. Ron's and they're great there. concerts. Yeah. And you do, you. you do a lot of time. I mean, you, you are very generous with your time on those. And I mean, my goodness, what a, what a treat to... Guys, I mean, people, this is just wonderful to have access to this great artist. He's a, not only that, but a great human being, Steve Sander. Wow, I'm going to hire you as my agent. Well, well, that's the way I feel about you, my friend. <laughs> oh, thanks, I love you very I much. It. I really do. I love you very much. Love you, too. And I, hopefully I'll be back in Sedona to visit when this, uh, when, when it's time, and uh, we'll We'll get together, and uh, I'll, got see, I'll make a point to it's see good. you too, Summer. Yeah, that'd be great. Yeah, I mean, I'm 90 years old. You got to better get here before it's over. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> when is oh your birthday's in May? May 16th? Is that right? May 16, yeah. Uh, well, it's coming up. Is that the big? I'll be, I'll be 91 in May. 91. 91. Yeah. All right. Well, we'll have to have a celebration. Uh, and we'll, we hopefully we'll do a follow-up interview. And uh, after Ron is going to take a little vacation after this interview, this has been a marathon. 
gotta take a nap. Yeah. <laughs> Cheese and crackers and champagne. Have you got some? <laughs> you're gonna have that for supper? Oh yeah, why not? <laughs> oh, you are okay. Yeah, it's about yeah. your dinner time. It's about my dinner time too. I'm way past dinner time actually. <laughs> yeah, this okay. is getting way into the night for you, isn't it? Yeah, you did notice how the the I have a, I had this perfect lighting with the outdoor lighting, and it it went away. So all I have is this little light over on the other side. So what is that okay. in the back? Or is that? Bye. <laughs> what's in the background? Behind you? I can't. Uh, this is a. Stu I have this studio building in little town Vanderbilt, Michigan, three hundred population, and um, uh, one of, a friend of a friend uh, is allowing me to use this one-time art studio that's just laying vacant, and he owns the building, and he said. Steve, you know, pay some of the expenses and you can use the building. And I've got all my, I've got two different sets of, of sound, of video stages for one for jazz and one for Indian chanting. And um, I do the uh, live streams uh, at least three times a week, sometimes more. Wow. Well, it's a very nice setup you got. It's really cool. Yeah, yeah very cool. Yeah. It's really just got a nice vibe. <clears throat> like it. it. It is. I, I'm happy and I, uh, I, I love playing live music, and I'm still playing live on the internet, which is not quite the same, but I love trying to reinvent myself. I'm, I wake up happy every morning. Now, the, this show is, is available to people. Uh, there'll be a repeat. This is going to be they posted on YouTube. Anybody can watch it. So, and, uh, it is, even though we're signing off now, they can still this watch can be, the show. This can be watched later, anytime on YouTube. Or Facebook, it's more convenient to watch it on YouTube, I would say. And right. um, so you tell your friends. And um, we had a pretty good little crowd here. Uh, I think we've we've lost a few along the way. A few have dropped off. <laughs> we tried to be as interesting died. as we could. Oh, <laughs> But uh, it's been fun. It's been like a party talking with Ron Bacon and and his daughter Summer, and um, it's uh, too much fun. Uh, too but much fun. Uh, I guess we'll have to uh, sign off for now, and and hopefully we'll continue at some future date. And if uh, I guess, how can they reach you if they want to leave a message for you? Can we? They can leave a message on the Facebook, right? Your Facebook page. They can. He has he has a website which is ronbacon.net. Oh, uh, there you and go. they can read some of his stories there. And do you want to give out your email okay. address? No, not the email, no. but uh, okay. but 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 yeah. ronbacon.net Ron Bacon. is very easy. Ron yeah, ronbacon.net. Yeah. Easy to remember. Yeah, and I I'll set that up so it leads them to the, uh, Facebook. I'll put it right here. Yeah, yeah. If I may. That's where he has his blog. I'm trying to get him to get all his stories written down. You can reach him at ronbacon.net. There we go. Thanks, Steve. So that'll be permanently on the replay, too, so they can see that. Oh, yeah. Thank you. All right. All right. Well, au revoir. <clears throat> I hate to say goodbye. It's, it's very hard to say goodbye, but I guess it is. <laughs> we did get a lot in, and I can't say that we... Uh, can't say that we slacked off too much. We, we got as much in as we could. So thank you all for watching. Ron Bacon, uh, a pioneer in live television in the, in the 50s with the Lawrence Welk Show and many other shows. The, it, it got a sheet of his resume too that is too long for me to even read or we didn't get through half of it. But we- Yeah, maybe we, in the future you'll find out who won, the, who won the match between him and Marlon Brando, uh, the, the chess match. Yes, that's, oh, that's that's what I yeah. forgot to ask you that. Who who did win no, that match? No, no, no. That's that's the cliffhanger. Yeah, that, I yeah you cliffhanger. Gotta, you have to read about it. <laughs> <laughs> I think you actually told me at one time and I can't remember. No, he's, no? he's only told me. You, you wouldn't have told me? Old, You're the only one who knows, Summer? The only people who know are the ones who've read the story. That'd be me. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Love you guys. Thank you all for watching. Don't forget to wash your hands. Okay. That's coming from Beverly Adam. I didn't. Oh, that's good.
cousin Bev. Bev. Yeah, yeah. Hi, Beverly. <laughs> hi, Beverly. Okay. Have a nice evening, you guys, right. and enjoy yeah. Sedona. Well, I'll be going back out into the zero degree weather here. I'll be thinking about you. <laughs> and I'll be thinking about you anyway. Thanks. Thank you so much, Steve. Thank you. Good night. Bye. Everybody. Four. I'm going to do the director. Three, two, one.